so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. If you haven't figured it out yet, I, I had a volunteer that uh, uh, drew on a board for me. They said, Pastor, your handwriting is atrocious. Let us do it for you. They pushed me out of the way, and they added some, uh, some uh, eyebrows to it, some mean eyebrows. We're talking about anger today. Uh, this is a very famous verse in verse 26, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, anger is an emotion. And I really want to talk about the angry Christian today. I want to talk about this concept of righteous indignation. I want to throw a question at you. Do you think that righteous anger is an oxymoron? Now, if, you, if you're too much of a moron to know what that word means, an oxymoron is a contradiction. Sorry. Uh, so, what you think about it, is an oxy, I'm sorry, is a righteous anger, is it a contradiction? Is there a time that we're justified in being angry? And if so, when? And is there a time when we think we're justified in being angry, but we're actually in sin? The warning here is that uh, anger is a tool in your toolbox, if you will. Now, just to show of hands, who has some form of a tool in their vehicle? Who has it? Just about everybody has some form of a tool. Who has a four and a half or four pound sledgehammer in their in their car? You guys don't carry a sledge? What in the world? Don't now think. Now hold on. It is a tool that you're probably not going to need most days. Who has a sledgehammer of some sort, a heavy hammer? Who has it? Just throw hands. Yeah, we all have a hammer, especially a big one when you really need one. But that's not something we carry around with us all the time, every day. Hey, it's one thing to carry a pocket knife. It's another thing to carry a four-pound sledge with you everywhere you go. That'd be kind of goofy, wouldn't it? Yeah. People say, man, you're a little bit out of balance on that, aren't you? Well, listen, anger is a tool and uh, that applies to Christianity. But I don't want to be known as an angry Christian Anger is an emotion. It's not a sin to feel angry. It becomes a sin how you respond when you're angry. Notice he said, be ye angry. We've known people, be ye angry. Be ye angry. I do well to be angry. Isn't that what Jonah said? God said, do you well to be angry? He says, I do well even unto death. Suicidal soul winner. That's what I call Jonah. He had a bad attitude. He was angry with God's mercy towards somebody he didn't like. That's not righteous. This is a warning for believers. And, and really, uh, to complete it, it would be anger versus sin. Anger versus sin. Not all anger is a sin, but most of the time it is. The warning is... Uh, if you if you just and listen, I, I do have a really nice sledgehammer. I don't want to boast of my tools, man. When I was on a job, we had to use it on a regular basis, and I learned to love it because I borrowed somebody else's, and it was a cheaper three pound, you know, dollar store Harbor Freight sledgehammer. I went and bought the real deal, man. I bought a good tool, and I loved that thing. It had a longer handle and a bigger head, and had an extra. I mean, I, I, I in comparison, I was like, I really loved that tool. But you know, think about it in Christianity. If you've ever just been, you know, I do well to be angry at, and you start filling in the blank. Listen, I've heard it my whole life from uh, my father primarily and probably some other preachers as well. I'm sure it wasn't original of him, but many churches destroy themselves because they stop looking out. They quit looking out, and they start looking in. And they, they point their guns inside, and they find problems on the inside, and they find reasons to pick each other apart. And I don't like how you do this, you drive that, you said this, and you do your, this with your kids, and we don't do that. And uh, according to my standard, you're, listen, that, that's wrong, that's, that's, that's in sin when we begin to judge other people outside of our scope. And I want to talk about anger today, in a sense. Um, anger in the Bible, there's a few words that mean anger. Wrath, W-R-O-T-H, is the first place it's mentioned. We're in Ephesians 4. This morning we were in Genesis chapter 4. And uh, who was wroth? Cain was wroth. And his countenance changed because God didn't accept his sacrifice. Now, the anger itself wasn't a sin. It's what he did when confronted with the truth. That's when he sinned. It wasn't just being angry that made a sin. And listen, I want to see Christians in control of their emotions. Not emotions in control of your household or your lifestyle, your mind. Uh, anger or wrath or being hot is another word the Bible used. Being displeased. 
is another word that the Bible used for anger. And uh, there is a time to be angry. We'll talk about it. It's not an oxymoron. Uh, but there is a problem with those that talk a lot about anger. Usually, they become angry people and they sin a lot. I want us to be a, a church of believers, a congregation of Christians, of saints that know there's a place for anger and it's not in our home every day. It's not in our mouth every day. It should not be your reputation that you're an angry man. Look, we all make mistakes. But it ought not to be that that's the emotion that you're defined by. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to see that's what your children choose to put on your headstone? An angry man. No, how about a loving father? How about kind and tender-hearted and, and, and edifying and exhorting and encouraging? Wrath is a sin when it's used in the wrong way. So here, here's what happens. You get angry and you don't let the sun go down on your wrath. You see what it says there, right? Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You get wroth, you get angry. When you turn it into wrath, if it's the wrong way, you're in sin right away. So when you get angry, sometimes something happens and you get stirred in your emotions and you're, so, you're like, I am just upset. And before it ever comes out of your, this is when you have to make a choice. You have to stop and analyze and realize anger is an emotion, but my response is a choice. And I can choose to remain angry and not let go and not forgive and then you become bitter. That's a sin. Or you choose to respond quickly and answer right away before you've heard the whole matter. And maybe you sin with your tongue by falsely accusing or tearing somebody down. Hey, what's that proverb in there? There's power of death and life in the tongue. And when you get angry and you let your tongue do some destruction, you're literally tearing somebody apart that you might love. You're destroying them. You're killing them. We ought not to allow this to uh, control us. Wrath. The, the action in response to anger is what can be a sin. Taking matters into your own hands is a sin. And listen, how you respond, when you find yourself getting angry, because it will happen to everyone in here. Is there anybody in here so foolish to raise your hand and say, I just don't get angry, it never happens to me. Uh, thank you, I didn't think so. All right. So when you get angry, now that I know for a fact you guys get angry, just like I do, when we get angry, we have to recognize this is an opportunity for us to receive a blessing if we respond well. If we don't, what's the opposite of a blessing? Now, I don't want to curse on my life. I don't want to curse the blessings that God has given me. I don't want to be a curse or a thorn in anybody's side. We saw this morning how Cain was wroth with God and he lashed out at his brother. That was sin. There was a curse put on his life for that. Jonah was angry because of God's mercy toward a nation that he just hated. He didn't, he didn't want to be friends with them. And uh, Jonah ended up afflicted by God. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Flip ahead just to two chapters. Allowing yourself to express anger openly, verbally, will teach your children how to be wrathful. Now, our goal is not to raise a bunch of angry children, is it? No, of course not. Look at Ephesians 1. Our children memorize this. We want them to learn this. But be careful, Dad. There's one for you in here too. Be careful, Mom. It applies to us. Look at verse 1. He says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Listen, I still obey this to, my, to, to, to today. I try to honor my parents and obey them in the Lord today. And I want God's blessing. I believe this promise and I'm living this and teaching my children. That's why I try to maintain a good relationship with my parents because God told me to, right? Well, look what he says again. He says, verse 3, this is to us. He says, that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. There's the blessing if you obey. Verse 4, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture of and admonition of the Lord. Provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them. Nurture is love. Bringing them up in the admonition of the Lord. Go back to Ephesians 4. Listen, home should be a peaceful place. And here we are commanded as parents not to be angry with children. This is uh, not just for the fathers, it's for the mothers as well. Uh, and it's for the older siblings to the younger. Uh, we need 
peace in our household. Blessed be the peacemakers. I don't want to bring a curse into my house. And I, I, I'll tell you that um, I'm guilty of being angry and sinning with my mouth. And one of my children said, I don't like it when you yell. Please don't yell, Dad. That broke my heart. It hasn't fixed the problem. Look, I'm a work in progress. I'm not perfect, but I want to raise good children. And and what that means is I really have to examine myself more and more. This is a fact. We really need to evaluate our words and make sure they're kind and building people up. It's our job to lift them up and promote peace through our words. And when we lose it, we fail. In fact, look what he says in verse 26. He says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. I want you to understand this. When you let anger turn into wrath, you are giving the devil a foothold in your life, in your household. It is a sin. It's a sin when you're selfish and you're lashing out and you let anger and wrath come out of your mouth. Notice he says, neither give place to the devil. You know, there is a place... In Romans 12, he says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Now think about this. These two, these, these are parallels. We're going to go here in just a second. In Romans 12, he said, There's a pl- give place unto wrath, but don't give that place unto the devil. When do we sin when we're angry? When we give place to the devil instead of controlling the wrath and not letting it spill out into our life. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. I will repay. Do you believe that? If you believe God will avenge you, then you don't have to worry about avenging yourself. Now, when am I in sin? Well, I get angry, I've been wronged. I need vengeance. I want revenge. I want a pound of flesh. I want to be justified in everybody's eyes. I'm going to say this. I'm going to fight him back. That's a sin. That's a sin. That's when I'm letting the wrath spill out of me. And I'm seeking my own vengeance. That's to say to God, I don't believe you're going to get him as good as I can. Whoa. That's to say, God, I'm going to settle the score. I don't need you to settle it. I'm going to do it my way because I know what they deserve right now. You don't know what God's got going on in the whole situation. And when somebody smears your name or runs it through the mud or falsely accuses you, our human nature is but I or but they. Right right away you have a comeback. And answering again, I think the Bible calls it, or back talking. When a child is is brought forward, did this happen? The answer should not be another child's name. Yeah, but so-and-so did not. You answer your question first. I'm asking you what you did. Too many times we seek our own vengeance. Take a step back in Ephesians 4. Go back to verse 22. Now you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Conversation means walk and talk. Put off that old lifestyle and those old words, that corrupt communication. It's all about lust and what you desire. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know what's unique? Uh, The the wrath of man worketh not... Somebody help me out. The righteousness of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When I get angry, and then I turn it into sin by allowing wrath to spill out, I am not doing something righteous in God's eyes. I'm taking my own vengeance. I'm going to get my revenge. I'll do it my way. I want to get what I want, and I'll feel better about it. No, I'll, I'll feel bitter about it. <laughs> I'll, have problem, I'll regret it later. Then I have to come back and humble myself and apologize for what I said and did. And maybe I didn't mean that, and I didn't know all that, and I missed something. I'm sorry. You know, you know how it works, but some people just harden their heart, and it continues to get worse. He's talking about being renewed in the spirit of your mind, becoming a new man. Why? Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When you get angry and you begin to sin with your mouth, you are not demonstrating the righteousness of God in your life. You're doing the opposite, self-righteousness. Verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying... See, in context here, he's talking about a lot of the sins of the mouth, things that we do wrong with our mouth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor... For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. 
Neither give place to the devil. When do you give place to the devil? When you let him have your tongue. When you get angry to the point of sinning. Look at verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. What should come out of your mouth? That which is good. To the use of edifying. The things should come out of your mouth that are good to building people up, to edify them, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It should be a pleasant thing used to help people. Yeah, but you don't understand. My, my child was wrong and I have to correct them. Hey, human nature is to yell. Now, we've all seen the ones yelling in the grocery store. I hope I'm not that bad, but I'm guilty of yelling at times and I'm working on it, right? I, I want to fix this. We've seen the ones, hey, hey, from across the store. And I'm like, just beat them already. Get it over with. What are you doing? You know, either, either shut up and leave them alone or go deal with it. But quit just yelling across the store. You're not accomplishing anything. Human nature is just to, to yell. But you know, he's saying there's more we can do to build. That's the solving the heart problem. You can build them up and solve the heart problem if you'll condescend uh, to men of old estate. If you'll bring yourself a little bit lower and come to their level and talk to them with kind words and sweet words. Look what he says again. He says, but that which is good. This is verse 29, the second half. That which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. How do I know when my mouth is sinning? Well, is it ministering grace? Is it edifying? Is it good? And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we all know the verse about... Not, now, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. What's the application? Sinning in anger. Sinning with your mouth. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When anger becomes wrath, it's a sin. You're not building up, you're tearing down. This is what we should avoid. We can see it clearly in these passages. Look, he continues about warning us. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor clamor is loud and confusing and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice malice malicious intent harmful get these things out of your mouth when you're hurting somebody with your tongue and tearing people up and being bitter and gosh i mean these are things that we should not have a reputation as as a christian there's a time to be angry we're going to get to that in one second but first i just want to set the table here's what we should not do it should not be this hateful, mean, destructive attitude. That's a spirit we don't want in our church. We don't want it in our family. Listen, I don't want it in my heart. I've been guilty of it. I've sinned. I've asked for forgiveness. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean I've completely overcome it. But I'm working on this. And I want, I want us as a church to work on this and be aware of it. I think it's important to discuss this and talk about this so that we together can strive for a clear goal. Verse 32, look at this. Here's our goal. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Boy, God was kind to you, wasn't He? God was tender with you, wasn't He? He was kind with you. He forgave you. Now, can you do the same with your spouse or your brother or your child? I think we can, but it does take work. Go to Romans 12, if you would. Go to Romans chapter 12. If you read your daily proverb today, in verse 3, it was, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. If you will keep your mouth from saying things, then you will prevent the destruction on others and on yourself. I have to ask you a question. Please don't answer. Do your children yell at you? Do your children yell at you? Uh, Brother Luke, put your hand out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do your children yell at you? If so, it's probably because that's what you taught them. You yelled at them, and they think that's how we communicate, and they yell back at you. If you have a problem in the house with that, and you probably have to stop and say, oh, no, hold on, I've been doing it wrong. So what do I do? Fix the problem today. Start today. Yeah, but I did it for you. Oh, it's okay. Just start today. Start changing how you talk. Start fixing the problem day by day. Stop yelling. Romans 12, look at verse 7. 17, I'm sorry. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense, that means repay, to no man evil for evil. We don't always have to get even. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as liveth in you, live peaceably with all men. He said, listen, when there's an opportunity to be a peacemaker, you should take that opportunity. 
Don't just be looking for a reason to be an enemy. There's a blessing for being a peacemaker. That's a righteous spirit. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And there it is. If you're avenging yourself, you are giving place to the devil, and you are sinning through your anger. There's a time to get angry and how to deal with it. That's where we're going next. But first, recognize this. How do I know when my anger is wrong when, when you're avenging yourself? When you're settling the score? When you're getting what you think you deserve? That's when it's a sin. Look at the next verse. Verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. What a statement. How do we do that? By feeding your enemy, by not avenging yourself. How do I overcome the evil that's coming at me? Don't be evil. We don't return fire for fire in that regard. We return water for fire. You come at me with fire, I'll give you some water and say, God bless you. Go to Mark chapter 3. I want to show you this where Jesus got angry one time. I believe he might have been angry a couple times, but there's one place in the scriptures where it's very clear that he was angry. It tells us that. You say, when can I be angry? When is it a sin? First, I'll tell you, you must have a legitimate cause, a righteous cause in being angry. Matthew 5, he said, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. If you're angry with your brother and it's not a righteous cause, God will judge you. He will bring some judgment on your life. Now, this reminds me of King David. Before he was a king, when he was a boy, he came up and when he shows up to feed the soldiers, his brothers, and he sees this Goliath, this giant, scaring everybody, cursing God and God's people. And he says, you know, somebody should take this guy out. And they say, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. He says... What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Listen, don't be angry at your brother without a cause. But when there is a cause, and you think about how David operated. Did he storm the field and get angry? Why, you mean old rotten? Did he run out there yelling and cursing? No. He responded to his anger in a righteous way with a clear mind. He had a clear vision. He went over and he's probably whistling. Singing a hymn to himself, picked up a few stones, checked his sling tension. He was he, well thought out, right? He wasn't, he didn't have blow his top. He wasn't seeing red. Jesus, when he made the scourge, he wasn't angry where he couldn't control himself either, right? Isn't that the definition of power, of being able to control yourself? Isn't that part of growing up, going from a, a child to young adulthood when you really learn to control your body and be in control of the functions and the wiggling and all that kind of... Isn't that part of it? And we even have that as adults. You drink too much coffee, I can tell. You wiggle a lot in your seat, you know. David had the right attitude. Jesus had the right attitude. You're in Mark 3. Look at verse 4. I'll show you how Jesus responded. He's talking about healing them. They get angry. He, healing the man. They, the, the Pharisees get angry. Uh, Mark 3, verse 4. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger. So here, here is Jesus. He, they wouldn't answer. Is God's law to do good, to save life or to kill? Which is it? It's an obvious answer. It should be a no-brainer, right? And he looked round about them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. How did he respond to anger? He did life. Good. He, he used it for good. He overcame evil with good. Notice he didn't call fire down from heaven. That, what did he say to his disciples? You know not what spirit you're of. Go to Exodus 22 if you would. Uh, uh, there's a few areas in the Bible that it's acceptable to God for someone to be angry. Serving other gods is one of those things. Because that's not avenging yourself. Being angry for God's sake, right? Not for your selfish calls, your selfish vengeance. There are many times in the Bible where God sends people on a mission. They're clear-minded and they're using force 
to set the record right, to do what's right in God's eyes. In Exodus 22, look at this, he says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or a fatherless child. Exodus 22, 22. What, what, when's another time it's acceptable to be angry? When somebody is harming the innocent. When somebody wants to hurt the innocent, those that can't defend themselves, this is a righteous cause in being angry. Right? Exodus 22, 22. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child, if thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. My wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. Talk about, talk about revenge. God says, don't you hurt those that can't defend themselves. We should defend the defenseless. That's our job as Christians. We should stand up for what's right, not go along with a, a multitude to do evil. Go to Second. Samuel chapter 12. Proverbs 24, he says, If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he ponder the heart that consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? He says, Listen, if you see somebody that's about to be murdered, about to be killed, and they're innocent, if you don't defend them, I'm going to hold you guilty. I see that. Don't just say, well, I'm glad I'm not part of that. No, if you have an opportunity to save an innocent life, you should. You should. Now, there's a difference. Not grabbing a dog by the ears, getting involved in somebody else's sinful drama, obviously. You're in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Look at verse number 5. I want to show you David's righteous indignation. When was David anger in a rightful way? 2 Samuel 12, look at verse 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Here David is judging righteously according to a godly cause. The only problem is, man, he's the man. Look what it says in verse 6. And he shall restore the land fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. Listen, David got angry in a righteous way. This was right. And, and this was such a unique thing where he brings him this story of somebody stealing somebody's lamb and doing this wicked act. And when David hears it, he says, Who would do such a wicked act and hurt somebody like that and destroy life? That man deserves to die for his sins. And he says, Thou art the man. Now, David humbled himself. David had the correct response when confronted with his sin. Saul did not. I want to show you a couple things about Saul with what time we have left. If you would, go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. I, I, I will probably preach a sermon sometime soon about the downfall of Saul and the things that happened in his life. He started out well. He was among the prophets, it says. Um, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Verse number 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion as serve thee, for God is with thee. Now Saul was a humble worker. He was a lowly man, and God was using him uh, to be established as a king. He started humble. Uh, jump ahead to verse 22 in this chapter. 1 Samuel 10, verse 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither, and the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. Talk about humble. Hey, we're going to make you king. Now, was he self-promoting? No, he's like, I'm going to go hide. I'm not sure. That I'm going to go hide in the stuff from this responsibility. Jump down to verse 26. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. Now here, his response to anger was righteous. He's starting out great. Humble, lowly, another man prophesying in the name of the Lord. Here comes anger at him. He held his peace. He didn't pick a fight. He wasn't reviling, returning fire, and picking a fight. Uh, go to the next chapter. Uh, we'll just start in verse 1. 
Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon Israel. Imagine this. We're surrounded by the enemy. Hey, we're going to make a deal. It'll work out. We'll let you live. But we want to see you guys come and pop your eyeball out. What? At what point do you say, no, I, I think I'd rather die fighting than come and do that to some wicked group. Now, of course, they call unto, unto the Lord. Look at verse 3. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days respite that we may send messengers on all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul and told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Behold, Saul came after the, after the herd out of the field, and Saul said, What aileth the people that they weep? And they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. Look at this. And he took a yoke of oxen, and he hewed them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto the oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. God's Spirit falls upon him. He gets angry. These people are going to come and destroy the innocent, pop out their eyeball and enslave them. We need some righteous men to stand up and defend the innocent here. In fact, so I'm going to cut this up, and that's going to happen to you if you don't come fight with me. We're going to defend these people. Let's do it. God was beginning to use him in unifying the kingdom, bringing it all together here. And so his anger here was righteous. It was a good thing. The problem is anger is not always a good thing. Right? It says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. I don't want to be hated for my anger. It says, A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth his shame. When somebody's angry and they're a fool, boy, you know it. They're loud and they're obnoxious about it and they're hurting people and they're saying things. Proverbs 22, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. Listen, if you're a Christian, you say, you know, there are times I am angry and I've enjoyed it and I've been guilty of this. It's probably because you've been friends with an angry man. It's time to sever that friendship. It's time to change the influence in your life. Proverbs 14, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Psalm 37, 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. When you feel it boiling up in you, just let it go. Count to ten, walk out the door, do what you have to do. Say, forgive me, I need to excuse myself before I become a fool. I don't want to hurt you. Ecclesiastes 7, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. He says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. If you would go to 1 Samuel 13. Saul continues to reign after his first year. He makes a mistake. He does a sacrifice on his own. He does it out of fear. Actually, go to chapter 14 just for the sake of time. He, he sins, he does the sacrifice, he takes matters into his own hands. And he then begins to be full of pride. If you would, look at 1 Samuel 14. Look at verse number 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until the evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. Now, they had finished a battle and he says, hey, I'm making a proclamation. I'm the king around here. You people can't eat any food until I get revenge of my enemies. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. What did we learn earlier in Romans chapter 12? He says, uh, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Saul was seeking for his own revenge. So it says here that I may be revenged. He was full of pride. He was full of anger. And the people were cursed because of it. If you would, look at verse 24. Let's just continue here. 
I read 24, 25. And all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people were come into the wood, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Therefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in honeycomb and put his hand in his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. Boy, if you're having a rough day, drink you some good honey. Look, he was, oh man, he's rough in the battle. He dips it in, he gets some honey, he gets some, some energy back. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. Now look, he's, this is an honest response. You're supposed to obey your parents. What's right in the Lord? Children, if your parents tell you to steal from the store, don't do it. That's not right in the Lord. And here Jonathan said, This is not right. Before the, Why are you troubling the land and preventing us from having food in the midst of a battle? He says, Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little bit of this honey. How much more if haply the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there not been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines, he's saying, you know, we could have fought so much better. We would have had, we would have been happy and we would have had eaten freely and we would have rejoiced in this victory. Instead, there's a curse on the people. It doesn't make any sense. You see how anger can be very destructive. If you would go uh, to verse 43 in this chapter. Saul's trying to figure out what's going on. Verse 43, Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and lo, I must die. And Saul answered, God do so more to me, do so and more also, if thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Now wait a minute. He's going to kill his son? He sinned by doing the sacrifice. He gets full of pride. He puts a curse on the people. He's angry. He's avenging himself. He wants to clear his name. And here's the result. He's going to kill his son? Because he made an oath that his son wasn't aware of? Verse 45, And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. If you would go back to Romans chapter 12. Look, God wants us to use our tongue for a blessing, not for a curse. Be angry and sin not. Understanding this concept is something where you have to evaluate yourself. You need to judge yourself. You need to examine yourself. You need to hold yourself to the highest standard possible. You need to work on yourself, and then you won't hurt others. Our tongue, what's he say in James? What, what a, a matter a little fire kindleth. Our tongue can destroy whole families and lives, and we forget that. Sometimes we're so close to the, we're intimate with the people we're the closest with, and we kind of ignore how sensitive they are. We hurt him with our tongue. I want you to consider your words. Make sure they're words that are building up people, putting away lying. Make sure it's not corrupt communication, not bitter, not wrath. Instead, be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. God has a purpose, and it's that we overcome evil with good. You're back in Romans 12. We'll finish it with this. Look at Romans 12. Verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. That's the standard. How do I know that I'm, I'm, I can be angry and not sin? When you take it in your own hands to avenge yourself as Saul did, it's a sin. What was David's answer? That man should die. Thou art the man. Woe am I, Lord, forgive me. You recognize that, that your, your, your anger is turning into sin and wrath with your mouth. Seek the Lord. He says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. All the more, especially in relationships. Look, isn't it better to forgive? Even when you're in the right. I'm in the right! I have every right! To you know what? I love you so much, I forgive you. I just forgive you. 
even if I'm wrong for forgiving you, I'd rather be wrong for forgiving than wrong for being wrathful. And being wrong for destroying with my mouth. Verse 12, 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. There's the goal. Anger is an emotion. Let's control the emotion through the power of the Word of God. And let's determine that, that what, what was it? What was that verse again? That the, the uh, wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. When you're wrathful, you're probably in sin. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your tender, loving kindness. Lord, thank you for forgiving us for Christ's sake. Lord, help us extend that to our brother. Help us to extend that to our, our, our spouses and our children. Lord, help us to be a people that are known by our love and not our anger. We ask this in Jesus' name.